So welcome to our second day of uh, Islamic Norms in Secular Public Sphere Conference. And uh, I give the floor to Henry Brady, who is the chair of the first session. Thank you. Hello. Is this working? I'm not sure. Uh, is the mic working? Okay, I usually project without a mic, so. Um, I think uh, this uh, session and this conference are, are really very timely. I was struck yesterday by how Barack Obama uh, signed a proclamation on the National Day of Prayer, but did not, as George W. Bush had before him, actually go and in engage in some event in which he was seen praying and uh, doing a religious observance of some sort. And so it's very interesting to think about the lines between uh, the secular and the governmental part of uh, the world and religion and clearly this administration draws it at a different place than the previous administration. Uh, for what it's worth, uh, I listened to Right Wing Radio as part of my research, and they were going crazy yesterday about how Barack Obama was clearly not a godly person because he hadn't celebrated a day of prayer. And we can all make our own judgment about that. But as religion and government uh, more and more come into contact, and, and certainly have been in contact actually for a long, long time, uh, but now maybe even more so, uh, given the multiplicity of religions in America and around the world and how they're interacting through immigration and so forth, this conference is really, really important. So we have four wonderful speakers today. This is on how Western courts concretely deal with cases involving Islam. I love the, the phrase concretely deal, and so I, I'm hoping to hear something about some concrete. Uh, and what's going on. So let me go through our four speakers just to introduce them, and then we'll turn it over to our first speaker. Um, our first speaker will be uh, Daniel Weinstock. Uh, he holds the Canada Research Chair, a very prestigious chair in ethics and political philosophy uh, in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Montreal. He's published a lot on nationalism, justice and stability, and uh, the foundations of international ethics. So he's gonna be our first speaker. Asifa. Karashi is at the Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin Law School. Uh, she is uh, one of our own. She graduated from the University of California, Berkeley in 1988 uh, with a BA in legal studies, but she also got a degree in law from the University of California, Davis. Then she went on to get additional degrees at Columbia and Harvard Law School. Uh, so she's uh, seen law from a, a bunch of different perspectives. Um, she does work on uh, federal courts um, and uh, constitutional legal theory, uh, and also comparative focus on Islamic law. Our third speaker is Denise Helley, uh, who is at the uh, Institut National de Recherche Scientifique uh, at, uh, in Montreal. She was trained in anthropology, uh, has a PhD from the Sorbonne. She's also done work in political science, sociology, sinology, and other areas. She's done a lot of studies on the integration of immigrants in Quebec, uh, published 10 books, many articles, and continues to work on things such as the Chinese in Canada, Canadian multiculturalism, and so forth. She'll be our third speaker. Our fourth speaker is Musa Abu Ramadan, who is at the uh, Brzeit University. Uh, he is uh, a... Uh, expert on international law, Islamic law, and human rights. Um, and so he will be our fourth speaker. So let's go on. Uh, each one I've asked to talk for about 20 minutes. Uh, I understand that typically things may go a little long, but I will start gesticulating and looking like I'm uncomfortable uh, after 20 minutes. Uh, and then I used to have a practice, in fact, where I would hold up a number of minutes, and then when people got beyond the total amount of time, I would hold up the square root of minus one, which, if you know your math, is an imaginary number as an attempt to try to shame people into stopping. I won't quite do that, but I will at least make motions. So uh, without further ado, Daniel Weinstock, University of Montreal. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll, I will hold myself to the 20 minutes by uh, saying in conclusion at about 20 minutes and then speaking for another 10. Um, well, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'm, I'm afraid that I, I may be uh, disappoint those people who are expecting for concreteness of uh, application of, of um, courts to, to Islam. I don't know much about uh, courts um, and I actually don't know much about Islam. So uh, I'm a bit of the odd man out uh, at this conference. I hope though that I will have uh, something to uh, offer. 
Um, what I do know a little bit about is how liberal democratic regimes have, in general, uh, tried to accommodate uh, claims of cultural or religious difference. And what I'd like to do is two things in this presentation. The first is uh, sort of give you the lay of the land, as it were, as far as um, political philosophy is concerned, how these issues look from the point of view of political philosophers who have tried to come up with some kind of a general framework to think about ways in which particular cases of uh, accommodation should or should not be met uh, by courts, by legislatures, um, on the one hand. And then I'm going to talk uh, briefly about two very interesting uh, public policy documents that have been produced in Canada over the course of the last five years uh, in Ontario and in Quebec that attempt to give uh, some uh, guidelines on how, is there like a big vacuum cleaner outside or something? It just, it just surprised me there for a while, uh, but I, I wouldn't want people to suffocate. Okay. So for the first part of my presentation has to do with sort of the philosophical lay of the land, how liberal democratic theorists are thinking about these issues, which I hope will serve as a sort of helpful complement to some of the things that have been discussed uh, today. So. Um, those of you, people who've taken classes with me know that, you know, there are about, in my view, four or five jokes that account for about 90 to 95 percent of philosophical ideas. One of the jokes that for me accounts for about 50 percent of those philosophical ideas is a very well-known joke about, uh, which goes as follows. Uh, there's somebody uh, looking um, on his hands and knees, obviously looking for something underneath a street light. A uh, passerby, Good Samaritan, uh, comes by him and says, uh, what are you looking for? He says, I lost my keys. Uh, oh, did you lose them around here? And he says, no, I lost them somewhere over there, but here there's more light. Um, so I can repeat it <laughs> in case. Um, so, so I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a philosophical tendency to, to look uh, for the resolution of philosophical problems in neat, clear ways. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the reality that philosophers need to address sometimes is quite messy and doesn't admit of uh, neat, single principle uh, knockdown resolutions. And I think the area of religious accommodation is one of them. And I think that one of the interesting things that we've seen in the, la in the last few years uh, in the area of political philosophy dealing with the issue of religious accommodation is a growing recognition that one principle um, neat sort of theoretical frameworks that will allow us to deal with all of the problems that we need to face, all of the demands uh, for some form of accommodation that have been coming out of civil societies in a lot of Western uh, and non-Western countries, uh, that, that, suit, that that pursuit is illusory, that there isn't something like a neat uh, sort of theoretical package that we could sort of provide to legislators and to courts and to say, look, just apply this and everything will be okay. So if you look at the literature, and I'm going very fast and painting in broad strokes, so you know, those of you who know a little bit of political philosophy will know that I'm cutting corners a little bit. Um, there have been re really two attempts, I think, at uh, coming up with uh, a kind of a one principle, uh, neat resolution of uh, these issues that have come from different corners, as it were, from polar opposites of the ideological uh, spectrum. On the one hand, and we talked a lot about this yesterday in talking about France to some degree, there's what I will call um, liberal exceptionlessness. Right? The idea that we have a liberal democratic uh, compact that is based around a certain number of values and that those values should be applied in a way that um, doesn't suffer any exception. The rule of law is invoked sometimes as something that should be, impl in, in, uh, that should be applied uh, universally. The idea that, different citizenship, that differential citizenship is somehow antithetical to the ideal of equality. All these issues, all these sort of considerations have militated for a view that I would call uh, liberal exceptionlessness, the idea that uh, you know, liberal democracy provides people with a range of freedoms that they can do what they will with, but beyond that, um, demands for special treatment are unreasonable. So I think that that, you know, so for those of you who, who are looking for names, uh, probably in the last 10 or 15 years, the political theorist who's been most associated with this is the late um, and lamented um, uh, Brian Barry. Uh, who wrote a book a few years ago called Cultural and Equ Culture, Culture and Equality, which was quite a screed, uh, quite a, a diatribe, uh, which was probably also the most, as it were, sophisticated philosophically uh, attempt at articulating uh, a view of liberal exceptionlessness. Um, so why has liberal exceptionlessness crumbled? Well, I think there are a variety of reasons why people have realized that liberal exceptionlessness isn't a really a tenable position. One, and this came out a lot yesterday, you know, we're getting to the point in the conference where 
people start repeating themselves, things have been said but not by me, so uh, I'll repeat them anyway. Um, you know, the, the idea that liberal is somehow culturally, liberalism is somehow culturally neutral uh, is something that has become, uh, I think, uh, that has come under sustained attack. And in particular, one of the points that I think is uh, very interesting and difficult for liberals to uh, refute is a point that came out very clearly of some of the talks yesterday, which is that the liberal construction of religion Right? The liberal construction of religion as somehow to do with um, the espousal by different people of different kinds of principle, right? as if religions were all uh, sets of tenets, sets of uh, moral principles uh, that can be considered in various ways, held at arm's length, um, you know, is something that in and of itself is very, very partial to certain kinds of, let's call them Protestant, uh, broadly understood, forms of religiosity. So there's a kind of cultural non-neutrality about uh, liberal, uh, uh, the liberal political order which claims a kind of uh, neutrality. So the principle of neutrality as it were, can be uh, turned against liberalism uh, itself if it sort of aspires to the kind of exceptionlessness that people like Barry uh, aspire to. And then there's the realization that there are a lot of liberal principles that are part of the basic liberal package uh, uh, that actually themselves militate for exception, militate for treating people differently. In Canadian constitutional jurisprudence, the notion of reasonable accommodation is not uh, a result of, you know, uh, liberal judges in Canada having all gotten, you know, crazily multicultural at some point. It comes from an interpretation of the principle of equality. Treating people equally does not mean treating them the same. It's a mistake to uh, equate sameness and uh, equality. So the doctrine of reasonable accommodation just comes out of a very plausible reading of the doctrine of of equality. Uh, the same thing goes for freedom of religion. Freedom of religion is part of the basic package of any, uh, any liberal democracy, and it is probably an abuse of the notion of freedom of religion to say that you can be free to practice your religion, but only as it were in your bedroom or in your house. And any display of religiosity outside of the confines of the narrowly construed private sphere uh, is to be viewed as something that the state can intervene in. You know, it's a plausible case to be made that freedom of religion is not being respected by a state who would uh, circumscribe it in uh, that way. Same thing for the principle of autonomy. We heard uh, very eloquently yesterday from a speaker whose name I have now forgotten. Um, thank you very much. Um, Mayanti, Mayanti Fernando, that um, you know, a lot of liberal states will say that what we're trying to do is we want everybody to be autonomous, but lo and behold, it turns out that one of the prime exercises or manifestations of autonomy is people deciding to live in different ways, including ways that uh, may, from the outside, look like they're non-autonomous, right? Uh, devotion to a very traditional form of religion, as we saw yesterday from Mayanti's uh, presentation, is actually a form of exercise of the self upon the self, right? One that is uh, probably in a modern society where there are more people who look like us than uh, people who look like uh, devout Orthodox Jews in uh, Mile End, Montreal, for those of you who know Montreal, uh, you, know, you know, they are probably the more autonomous uh, in a way uh, in sort of separating themselves from a kind of broad consensus on ways of living that is characteristic of liberal democratic society. So on and on I could continue, um, but I won't. Liberal democratic values themselves, the absolute conceptual core of liberal democratic values seem themselves to give rise to um, the necessity for uh, thinking about accommodation and exception and uh, the, the, the organization of space and oxygen, as it were, for people to be able to live their religious lives in the way that they see fit in the public sphere and not only in the narrowly construed uh, public sphere. So that's how I would say the, the sort of liberal exceptionlessness doctrine has come to uh, get sort of um, eroded, uh, as it were, by the weight of its own commitments, right? Neutrality, well, you're not particularly neutral, are you? Uh, autonomy, freedom of religion, equality, all of these things can, without um, any sort of abuse or, or, or intellectual sort of gymnastics, give rise to a fairly generous kind of uh, politics of accommodation. And indeed, it starts looking like a form of special pleading by liberal Democrats themselves when they start reading these values in ways that tell against right, the possibility of any kind of accommodation. 
On the other hand, so that was the first kind of need. It would have been nice if we'd been able to say, look, you know, we have a set of principles. They tell against any form of accommodation. Uh, this is just the way it is. If you want to live in a liberal democracy, you accept this whole basic set of basic packages, and they just simply say no to all forms of accommodation. It would be nice in a theoretical sense because it would be easy. It wouldn't necessarily be nice in a moral sense. On the other end of the ledger, you have what one might call unreconstructed multiculturalism, which holds the view that, uh, as it were, cultural claims, claims for cultural exception are, as it were, morally self-validating, right? That the fact that somebody says, I need to be treated differently because this is part of my culture is something that has you know, uh, at least pro tanto, prima facie, and possibly even all things considered, moral uh, weight. Now, again, this position has the advantage of neatness. It's a one principle kind of knockdown position. It is also implausible, uh, at least for the following, um, for the following reason. Um, Multiculturalists tend to uh, be multiculturalists because they espouse the doctrine of, of, of tolerance. Uh, well, uh, what happens when a sort of unreconstructed multiculturalism gives rise to the creation of pockets within society of intolerant practice, right? So the problem that has been raised for the multiculturalist position to put labels on these things is what has been called the problem of internal minorities, right? So you don't want to create sort of separate sovereignties within which the kinds of safeguards that protect people in the broader society are absent. You want people uh, to be able to be protected within these communities as well. Internal minorities often refer to women, which is a strange thing because last time I looked, women were not minorities, but we'll put that point uh, aside uh, for the time being. So multiculturalism needs to be buttressed by some very broadly speaking liberal safeguards. For example, when it has to do with, with children, best interests of the child, right, uh, in some sense become a limit on the way that multiculturalism can be applied religious groups can't just treat their children in any old way. There's a case in Quebec right now that is uh, garnering a lot of attention. There are uh, two ultra-Orthodox Jewish schools that are, as it were, functioning completely under the radar, uh, not uh, subject to any Ministry of Education regulations. And you know this is seen as, I think, rightly a problem. You can be an exponent of freedom of religion and still think that children who haven't consented to anything yet in the way of religion should be given the wherewithal with which to consider whether or not to continue um, allegiance within the community and should therefore be given the wherewithal to live outside the community and be given the kind of education that allows for that. So best interest of the child is one of the ways in which the exceptionalist multiculturalist position has been eroded. Another principle is that of consent. Very important, and this started coming out uh, yesterday. For the liberal democratic sort of moral consensus, there are a lot of things that happen within religious community, in particular to do with relationships between the sexes, that looks like it's uh, unequal, that looks like it's hierarchical, that looks at the extreme like it may actually involve uh, some degree of harm. And so how do uh, multiculturalists or exponents of a tolerationist agenda sort of get around this? Well, they say, look, you know, consenting adults can subject themselves to a lot of things that we would otherwise think aren't okay. So what we have to do is guarantee that consent is present. How do we guarantee that consent is present? Well, we can't go around interviewing each individual person who's part of a religious community. We have to ensure that there are robust exit rights in place for these communities. What are exit rights? Well, you know, the ability to leave the community without undue harm were one to decide to do so. So there were cases in Canada about Aboriginal communities where property was retained by the community if a person uh, left, and there's jurisprudence about that. You know That is an, an abridgment of an exit right. If you tell someone, well, you're free to leave, but you'll be destitute if you do so, you know, it's a real question whether you've actually respected their uh, exit rights. There's an enormous literature on what conditions have to be in place in order for exit rights to be seen as real rather than merely formal. It's an interesting discussion, which I just don't have time to get into uh, now. So, as it were, we start off with these two sort of neat positions that are sort of like the guy looking for his keys underneath the uh, street light because there's more light there. And we realize that we actually do have to go muck around in the darkness if we want to find the key to um, the problem of uh, multiculturalist accommodation. And you know, the problem with, with, you know, with, with the mucky middle is that it's, it's, it's it's very, very difficult to see how a neat theoretical resolution can bring all of the considerations that are actually relevant to the decision about whether to accommodate or not a claim for religious exemption to bring them all into neat theoretical focus. Because the values that are at play are first plural, 
there are a lot of values, autonomy, right? religious freedom, equality, you know, you name them, they're all sort of relevant to the consideration of how we should treat particular cases of religious accommodation, and they are indeterminate in a variety of ways. They're indeterminate in at least three ways. They're indeterminate in terms of ranking, right? There are all these values that are clearly relevant to how to deal with religious accommodation in a liberal democratic order, but when they come into conflict, we have to have some kind of theory about how to rank them or some kind of practice that will allow us to rank them in the absence of a theory. So, for example, we had a big debate in Quebec in the, um, in the context of the Bouchard-Taylor uh, Commission, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, where you know, some people said, well, look, gender equality, guarantees to gender equality, should trump religious freedom. Right? Now, constitutionally, I'm not a constitutional scholar, but most constitutional theorists said, well, look, you just can't do that. You know? um, but you know, this is an interesting debate. You know, there, there's, there's all these values, and they come into conflict, and how do you rank them? Right? So there, there are indeterminacy of ranking. There's also indeterminacy, as I would call it, of implication. Let's all admit that autonomy, right, a liberal democratic order is one that wants to, um, uh, and in conclusion, um, <laughs> uh, now you've made me lost my, lose my train of thought. You, so I get an extra minute for, okay. okay. I haven't been speaking for 25 minutes. There's no, no, no way I've been speaking for 25 you've minutes. You've got five minutes left. To 20. You've got five minutes to 20. To 20. Very good. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Um, there's indeterminacy of implication. Everybody recognizes in a liberal democratic order, autonomy is one of the values that uh, needs to, as it were, be given some kind of weight in decisions. But how does autonomy tell? Which side of a request for accommodation is autonomy going to tell on? Will it tell on the uh, side of, uh, as it were, the liberal democratic majority, which thinks that religious ways are somehow benighted and that the autonomy of people is best promoted by giving them ways of getting away from it? Or is it best promoted? again, and I referred to my auntie's talk yesterday, by allowing people space within their traditions to express themselves within these traditions. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's indeterminate. Uh, and all of the values that I refer to, equality, uh, et cetera, are indeterminate in this way. They, can, they tell on both sides of the agenda. And then there's indeterminacy of the concepts themselves. Religious freedom, right, does not in and of itself tell us where the limits of religious freedom lie, right? There's a kind of core of the concept, and uh, to go back to the example that I gave earlier, I think there's probably a broad consensus to say that a society that says religious freedom, absolutely, you can practice religious freedom in your bedroom with the, draw, with the blinds drawn uh, where nobody can see you is not actually a respect of religious freedom. How far outside of that you have to extend, the concept itself will not help us, right? So how do we get away from these indeterminacies? Well, I think that one of the ways in which we get away, away from them is by uh, adverting to the consequences which different kinds of weighings and makings determinate will give rise to, right? Um, we, and I think the consequentialist reasoning is very, very important here. We can't just look at the concepts and sort of expect the concepts to dictate to us ways in which they can be interrelated, made it, you know, ordered, rank ordered, uh, made more de determinate. So what are some of the considerations that are relevant from the point of view of consequentialist uh, reasoning. Well, two seem to me to be particularly uh, relevant. One has to do with social cohesion. A lot of what uh, people are talking about when they um, talk about the impacts of different ways in which we're going to rank order values is what will be the, uh, the impact on social cohesion. Now, social cohesion is itself a very indeterminate concept. How much cohesion do we need in order to do what, right? Why do we need cohesion? What kind of cohesion do we need? And what is it that we need cohesion for? Um, you know, uh, but let's assume that there's something called social cohesion that we have a, a grip on that we want to measure the impact of different kinds of conceptual regimes uh, on, well, again, social cohesion won't help us terribly much. The French model seems to be that so social cohesion is uh, promoted when people are made to be roughly the same, right? When their particularities are left at the door and they enter public institutions broadly understood as bare citoyens, right? There's another view which has been expounded with a great deal of articulacy by my friend Ayala Shahar over at the University of Toronto, which says that if you push people to be too much like one another and deny their particularities, you'll get something that in a very sort of uh, evocative turn of phrase, she's called reactive culturalism, 
reactive culturalism. Le terme parle de lui-même, the term speaks of itself, you know, push people to be too much like everybody else, and they will be even more particularist than they would have antecedently be inclined, been inclined to be. And so if your interest is in social cohesion, you may actually have uh, sort of thrown the baby out with the bathwater by, um, yeah, by um, um, uh, insisting on too much similarity. Look at the issue of schools, the, veil with, uh, the uh, veiled girls in schools. You know, what is some, the thing that is going to promote the most cohesion? Allowing girls to go to schools, public schools in veil, with veils, where they're going to be sharing the public space with people who aren't like them and sort of undergoing the effect of uh, sort of the, the centra effect of, of being with a whole bunch of other people, or is it going to be by insisting that they can only go to schools um, not wearing veils, and then a whole bunch are going to go into private schools where they're not going to get the integrative effect of schools um, at all. Then there's the issue of the, the interests of women. We want to measure the impact of um, uh, different practices on women whose consent may or may not be easily ascertainable and whose exit rights may or may not be um, at, um, uh, you know, fully guaranteed. So in the Boyd Report, which I'll just say a word about in my conclusion in, in a minute, you have this sort of uh, uh, consequentialist reasoning as part of the argument, which says, look, you know, it could be that you know, women aren't exactly treated entirely as equals, but we have two choices. We can either uh, sort of ban them, drive them underground, they'll continue to operate, and the lives of women will be impacted by them. We can sort of claim that, you know, it's ostrich-like, we have, uh, you know, we're not countenancing this around here. Wouldn't it be better if we had a regime in which Sharia courts existed above ground and were somehow implicated with the uh, legal, demo the liberal democratic uh, court system, limiting the kinds of decisions that uh, they can make? There was an even more sort of controversial uh, case in the United States, I think in Oregon a few years ago, where a Somali community whose girls were being subjected to uh, rather amateurish forms of female circumcision, uh, the leaders of the community, along with doctors in one of the hospitals, said, look, we have to find a way of uh, dealing with this. Outright banning is not going to work because, again, the practice is going to be driven underground. Maybe we could find a way within the hospital where we could perform a kind of ritual marking that wouldn't be scarring or mutilating, right, that would count from the point of view of the culture as uh, ritual circumcision, but that wouldn't harm women. Uh, now, from a consequentialist point of view where women's interests are the bottom line, this might be an entirely sensible proposition. But the idea at principle that we countenance this kind of practice is something that's very difficult to arrive at. I'm about to be given the, um, the, um, the 60 second, the 60 second uh, warning. I should say that I was told until last night that I had half an hour. So it's, so in conclusion, I'm doing this so we can have some I know, discussion. I know, I know, I know. So I'll be, I'll be rather, um, I'll be rather quick. Um, so. Let me, let me just say where I'm, where I'm at right now. You have these two kinds of uh, principled, single principle ways of dealing with these problems which don't work. They push us into the much mucky middle where we have to recognize that there are different kinds of indeterminate and indeterminately ranked values that are uh, in play. There's no a priori way, philosophically, in which to do all of the ranking and makings determinate that we need to make. One of the ways in, in which to do it is to go consequentialist, but here, it's not as if we have something like utility that we can point to that will allow us to do the consequentialist reckoning of different kinds of uh, orders uh, easily. So how do, we, how do we do it? Well, the two documents that I pointed to um, in my introduction uh, do it in very different uh, ways, uh, and I'll have to be extremely, extremely quick. Uh, the Bouchard-Taylor report, which was written uh, last year in Quebec by two of our most eminent intellectuals, Charles Taylor and Gérard Bouchard, uh, in response to a set of sort of media-created crises about re religious accommodation in Quebec, basically opted for what I call, uh, in a book that I'm writing about these things now, uh, the strategy of denial. The strategy of denial basically says, uh, well, we can actually achieve some kind of conceptual clarity despite appearances. Bouchard Taylor tried to do it through the notion of laïcité ouverte, right? The idea that we don't have to be laïque like the French, but uh, we can practice something in, that is called laïcité ouverte, which basically says the following things. Institutions should be laïque, they should function neutrally, they should function without regard to religion, but the individuals who use and who work within these institutions, it's somehow a category mistake to say of people that they can be laïque. So public institutions are neutral, but the people who are within them can come with bearing their full identities on their sleeves or on their heads or, uh, or wherever, except 
right, in cases where, to use the language of the report, the public officials in question embody to the highest degree the course of authority of the state. So you have a principle that seems like it's going to neatly reconcile a bunch of things, and then we get the exception. Not judges, not policemen, not, uh, you know, a bunch of people who somehow embody the full course of authority of the state. So, you know, if I had a, more time, I would tell a longer story, but there's an appearance of something like neat conceptual reconciliation through the notion of laicité ouverte, and the messy pluralism comes in sort of the back at the end of the chapter where we realize we have to make a whole bunch of exceptions to give credence to a whole bunch of other values. The Boyd Report, which was, created, which was written in 2004, early 2005, it was published uh, by Marion Boyd, the former Attorney General of Ontario, opts for a different strategy, which is, I think, kind of the strategy of the recognition of messy uh, plurality and pointing to the need to come up with processes that are representative with which to uh, adjudicate these differences. So across the report, and I could talk about this in question period if people ask me the question, you have the recognition by Marion Boyd of the relevance of all of the considerations that I just spoke about. At certain points, Marion Boyd sounds like a kind of pure liberal, look, the reason why we should recognize uh, religious arbitration is that it's contract contract between private individuals and contract between private individuals in a liberal democratic order is sacred. A few pages later, you get the thing, well, but it shouldn't give rise to completely separate, uh, you know, sort of uh, legal orders because that would be contrary to. So you have this kind of, I don't know whether it's completely acknowledged or unacknowledged recognition of the messy plurality of, um, of the considerations that we have to uh, deal with. And in the end of the day, a call which, and I really will conclude with this, uh, unsatisfactory philosophically, but perhaps the best we can do for democratic deliberative procedures through which the messy plurality that I just talked about can be recognized and adjudicated through institutional practices in which the voices that need to be heard, the voices that need to be in, at the table in order to come up with an adjudication that is going to be uh, responsive to all of the considerations that are relevant to, uh, to their resolution can actually be heard. So in other words, for those of you who know the political philosophy uh, literature, and this really will be my last sentence, the call is to go procedural. There's no philosophical way in which to achieve neatness and reconciliation, and so the challenge is to find procedures through which we can achieve reconciliations with which we we can all live. This seems to be, to me, to be the plausible way to go, and it's a way that is pointed out in the Boyd Commission report, which, politics being politics, was published, debated for a few weeks, and then literally thrown into the shredder by the Premier of Ontario, Dalton McGuinty, uh, at the time, which seems to me to be a great shame. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs> That was a great quick tour through a, a lot of philosophy and a lot of thinking, and it was, certainly makes it clear how complicated multicultural liberal democracies really are. Uh, with that, now I, I think you really set the stage for thinking about, in fact, what concrete procedures can be devised and thought about to try to solve these problems. And with that, we'll go to Asifa Karashi, uh, University of Wisconsin Law School. Thank you very much. Is this on? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so yeah, I'm going to get empirical, which is kind of not what I loved. To, when I was a legal studies major here, what I loved was sitting and thinking about justice and being very abstract and theoretical. Um, and I'm pushed constantly into the empirical, largely um, by reality, but also the University of Wisconsin Law School's sort of motto is law and action. So I'm always being asked to like, you know, put it into action, which is the law and society tradition here anyway. So, um, so this is one example of that. It's actually not my main field of research, but it is something that I've written about and I've done some expert testimony kind of stuff in. And so it's nice to be kept on top of it. And um, I'm very grateful to Hedy and to Olivier for inviting me and all the organizers here to get me back into just updating what the research is on this topic. The topic is Muslim family law and US courts. How Muslim marriage contract, Muslim marriage cases have shown up in US courts where the US court was wrestling with trying to understand some claim being made by one of the parties that they had rights under Islamic law that they wanted recognized by a US court. So, like I said, I've, been, I've written about it, it's not my main area, but this is, I was happy to update my research a little bit. So this is actually one of, we've been talking for a day and a half now about the ways that religious minorities, especially Muslims, are asking for or should or shouldn't be accommodated in, in various ways. And this is one of the areas where 
accommodation is and isn't, as you'll see, has already been happening. It's been happening for a while, and it's within the context of the secular state courts that are already operating. Um, and it is the results of some of this, I think, is behind some of the motivations for Muslim family tribunals arbitration in places like Canada and now being talked about in the UK. And actually, there's been some discussion in the United States and the, and the Muslim lawyer community, although watching what happened in Canada, I think it's a little bit of a non-starter at this moment, but we'll see what happens. But anyway, so just to get you a sense, this is, again, a very quick tour, um, what is going on when these cases show up in, in, in the court, in the court, U.S. courts, family law courts? Basically, most of the United States, are, as every other religious community, are very multifaceted and very uh, not a monolithic group. But some, and many, many, feel bound by two sets of laws. So they feel bound by Islamic law in some way. They want their marriage to be valid in the eyes of God. They want their divorces to be valid in the eyes of God. And at the same time, they feel bound by the secular laws of the state that they're operating under. And especially if there's a conflict, if you need an enforcement of some right, you, you need the, any, whatever, whoever the sovereign power is that has the police power to enforce something. So they're, by default, have to deal with the, the U.S. law, even if they're not particularly emotionally connected to it. So um, what happens is, there's a variety of ways that Muslim couples will get married in this country. So sometimes you'll have a, both a civil ceremony and a Muslim ceremony. And sometimes you'll have the Muslim who's officiating the ceremony is also credentialed by the state in some way so that it it's, it's kills two birds with one stone, to use a very bad metaphor. Um, uh, <laughs> sometimes the imam, the, the, lead, the person officiating the Muslim ceremony, has no recognition by the state. And then the parties will decide then what to do. Do they have a separate ceremony in the state? or what? There's a, and the states are all different on the details of how to do this. Um, some will only, bother, if they only have the Muslim ceremony and do not have any kind of civil recognition, there's often a challenge, this is very risky if there's a conflict later on. Because obviously, if you have an issue where you're debating the paternity of the child or inheritance rights or health insurance rights or any of this sort of thing, the court is put into a situation of having to understand whether the parties were married in the first place. And so now they're thrown right into the question of, well, what is a valid marriage? A lot of the cases that we've seen in the U.S. courts have come from marriages happening outside of the United States, but now there's more and more, and as the Muslim American community gets larger and older and more established, I think you're going to see a lot more cases where everything has happened within the United States, and you're not really dealing with a comedy across you know, international borders. But the case, the case law right now is mixed together. So for example, there's a 1988 case from here in California where there was a muta marriage, which is a special type of marriage recognized within the Shia um, sect, of a temporary marriage set for a specific time. So the wife was asserting that they were married under this muta marriage, and the question was whether or not they were actually married under the, what they understood to be marriage. Um, and the court eventually dis, dis, dismisses any argument over whether they believed their marriage was valid under Islamic law, and instead just decided to just inquire whether it was valid under California law. But the interesting thing for me and for others looking at this case, the case, by the way, is uh, Vryonis versus Vryonis, 1988, California. Um, the, it, the issues that the California court looked at to decide whether or not they were married were the kinds of things that maybe a secular Western Judeo-Christian community might look at to see whether they're married, but they're not necessarily the kinds of things that a Muslim couple would look at to see to identify whether this couple was married. For example, they looked at the fact that the wife kept her own name, her own last name. That is a you know, European, Western, Christian type of tradition. It's not necessarily a Muslim historical tradition. So the fact that that was, a, that was a, a element in the analysis was interesting. Also that she kept a separate bank account, that they never had a joint bank account. Now again, just to go through some Islamic law, I mean, Islamic law, this is going to come up later in the community property topic, Muslim, the Islamic law has always held that a Muslim woman's property is her own property, that she has no, and no other person in her family or any, anyone has any claim over any income that she has in, in, uh, gathered. So it's very common, actually, for a woman to keep some kind of separate financial asset, separate from the marriage. So the fact that she did this isn't, by definition, some kind of indication that she didn't identify herself as married to this person. But in a cultural tradition where you th tend to think of the, the marriage being, you know, changing your name and becoming all merged together in property, you might think of that as different. So anyway, that's, that's one example of what happens with the kinds of indications that the court looks at. The biggest issue seems to be mahar. 
This is the dower of a certain amount of physical, any kind of property, usually money, that under classical Islamic family law um, is a condition of a marriage being valid. A marriage contract is not considered to be a valid marriage contract unless there is some provision of some kind of property. And I like the important to me to use the word dower, not dowry, because dowry brings up Jane Austen novels and you know the father having to come up with money to sell off his daughters. You know that's the kind of t sense that you think about it. This is the opposite. This is the groom has to bring money to the bride as a condition of the marriage. Marriage. She can waive it. She can make it be equivalent to a dollar. She can have it be something that is, there's a very common practice of having it a deferred amount, so it is payable upon death or divorce of the husband. But there has to be some recognition that the parties talked about it, and there's some acknowledgment of that. And so the form contracts that you'll see in, from mosques and things will have some kind of blank line where you write that in. Um, now, this has been a crucial issue in where family law has been adjudicated in the United States, where one or the other party is asserting whether they, she should get this mahar. And it's interesting from a woman's perspective, if you're thinking, if you come with the assumption that Islamic law is bad for women, which is often a very common pr presumption, um, if the mahar is quite large, you're wanting that to be enforced. If the mahar is quite small, you're not necessarily wanting that to be enforced, especially in a community property state where the community property of the couple might be actually quite high. So whether you're on the wife's side or the groom's side and who's going to get more money, it really has a, you're not necessarily going to argue for or against Islamic law being recognized here, depending on how the numbers shake down. But anyway. Um, there's a wide divergence in the, in the case law on various states on whether or not it's enforceable. Some would say flat out it's unenforceable. Dajani versus Dajani, also California Court of Appeals, says that they interpreted a mahar um, of a marriage contract, now this one's contracted in Jordan, to, uh, they understood this to be a prenuptial provision, which is a critical phrase that I'll talk about in a second. Um, that they called facilitating divorce, quote unquote, facilitating divorce because the 5,000 Jordanian dinars were payable to the wife only upon dissolution of the marriage. So they understood that to be a you know, motivation for divorce on the part of the wife and that that was considered against public policy so it wasn't going to be recognized. Um, they actually said it's considered profiteering by divorce on the part of the, of the wife. So held the, against the, the provision and so she didn't get her mahar in that case. Aziz Al-Hibri, law professor at the University of Richmond, complains about this case and says, well, this is a kind of, a very, first of all, it's a misunderstanding of Islamic family law because a couple of things. The deferred dower is also due upon the death of the husband. So you could say it's a motivation to murder as well. Um, but they didn't look at that part of it. The other thing is that, as we heard a little bit from um, Professor Masood yesterday, um, under the various details of how Islamic law operates, if a woman initiates the divorce, it's very common for her to lose the mahar as a condition of that woman-initiated divorce. And we have a debate of whether it should always be that way. But the fact is that the, if you really look at Islamic law, if she's, if she's initiating the divorce, she's very likely to lose the mahar. And so therefore, how could it be profiteering by divorce if, you're, if the mahar is some kind of, you know, anyway. It, it's, it's a confused application of trying to understand what was going on looking a little bit at Islamic law, but not looking deep enough, and then making these interesting conclusions. Um, OK, um, cases where the mahar has been enforced, actually, interestingly enough, um, a friend of mine uh, who works on the East Coast says he, he's interested in the New York and New Jersey cases where there's a much longer history of Orthodox Jewish couples going into various courts and asserting base, rights based on classical Jewish law. And there seems to be a bit more of an understanding or accommodation for things like the ketubah, which is literally the same word, kitab, ketubah, of uh, what, you, what you recognize. So Fahenrich versus Fahenrich um, in 1995, New York Supreme Court, it's a little, it changes the term, terminology a little bit. They use sadaq instead of mahar, but it's the same concept. Looks at, they actually say that it's, the sadaq is an Islamic marriage contract. It's a document which defines the precepts of the Muslim marriage by providing for financial compensation to a woman for the loss of her status as value in the community if the marriage ends in divorce. And so we will then enforce the sadaq. So a very different attitude about what the role of it is and, and sort of see, coming from a perspective of it has something to do with what her expectations were getting into the marriage and so and a, recogni and a recognition of that. They ultimately ruled the Sadaq was unenforceable, but not for a public policy kind of reason. They actually said, we have difficulty understanding the terms of the agreement. It was simply, basically a statute of frauds kind of argument for the lawyers here, that it was the terms of it were too vague, too un they were unclear under basic contract principles. For example, the Sadaq saying it was a, the Sadaq, quote unquote, being a ring advanced and half of the husband's possessions postponed. 
well, which possessions, at what time were they postponed? What, at what point are you calculating this, this you know, financial assessment? Um, they basically said, we don't understand the terms of this clause. So this is a lesson to many Muslims in the United States who are writing marriage contracts to be very, very clear. Many of these contracts are extremely vague. They say, oh, this marriage will be governed by Sharia, all right? Anyone who knows anything about Sharia knows that that is not a clear statement. There's many schools of thought, and it's going to have very strong in, in, implement, impact on the results of the case. So how much time do I have? You're about uh, 11 minutes in. So oh, you're good. Nine minutes. Excellent. OK. So. Um, now, I mentioned the prenuptial agreement phrase. That is actually an interesting complication, because there, for some reason, that has become a popular thing for Muslims to talk about, well, you must write a prenuptial agreement. And that seems, to, in many of the popular Muslim communities' that, that conceptions, I've noticed that they think that takes care of it. Um, and it's, the fact is that a prenuptial agreement under US law, state law, is a very specific concept with a lot of restrictions. And it really is not the same concept as what Muslims often mean when they're talking about their marriage contract. Now, now Islamic law historically has had the marriage contract actually quite, it's a quite detailed concept. And you talk about all kinds of conditions being put in the marriage contract to detail how the parties are going to live and operate. And, and it is really a contract of, of arranging details between the parties. Um, a prenuptial agreement, instead, in, in so the way the U.S. law thinks about it, is more or less a provision for financial distribution if there is a divorce. That is part of a Muslim marriage contract, but it is not the main part. And so speaking of these things in, in, as, a, as a, they were synonyms is actually quite problematic and legally becomes quite problematic. So Abed Awad, a friend of mine who practices this law in New Jersey, he insists, and he's actually won a case on this ground, saying that don't that Muslim marriage contract should not be looked at as a prenuptial agreement. He insists that it should be looked at as a contract. It's just simply a contract between two parties, and this actually gets back to a little bit what you were hearing earlier. And so the mahar is not consideration for the contract. It, it is a, an effect of the Muslim marriage contract, an automatic consequence whenever a Muslim marry, mar, a couple marries. And this is you know, borne out by the fact that you know, people will imply in the contract a mahar provision if there isn't anything in there. So in the case in New Jersey that he won, Odatala versus Odatala, he, he ha, they enforced $10,000 as a mahar clause in a contract between these two parties. And the judge actually says, well, why should a contract for the promise to pay money be any less of a contract just because it was entered into at the time of an Islamic marriage ceremony? Simple contract law case. These two people agreed to this amount of money. It would be exchanged upon this time. However, when I was looking stuff up for this conference, uh, that's not the end of the story. In 2008, last year in Ohio, Zawahiri versus Al-Watar, um, shows the complications, the confusion of these terms. And basically, Alwatar argues that it's a prenuptial agreement at trial. This is the wife arguing that her amount was a prenup and should be recognized as a prenuptial agreement. Lost at trial, goes up on appeal, and now she's arguing that it's a contract. Well, so let's recognize this as a contract. The court refused to look at this for procedural reasons, saying you can't make a claim that's conflicting with your earlier claim at trial, blah, blah, blah. But um, they did uh, argue that it if it is a prenuptial agreement, which is what her initial argument was, it doesn't satisfy it because of the special conditions of Ohio prenuptial agreement rules, which is basically, among other things, you have to have full disclosure ahead of time, the party should have lawyer advice at some point, and the details of how it happened were basically that the couple gets married, and at the time of the marriage ceremony, the imam says, well, what's the mahar? And they said, well, we really haven't talked about it yet, so they start talking about the mahar. They agree on the mahar on the day of the wedding. Well, this looks like a pushed through prenup to an American court. They say, well, you can't have that kind of last minute coercive kind of consideration, so we're not going to recognize this. From a Muslim perspective, I think the imam was like, you can't get married unless there's a mahar provision here. It's not a valid marriage contract unless there's something about the mahar, so it has to get done. If it doesn't get done today, you're not getting married. So again, very different ways of looking at the same concept. Um, so you have to be very careful about how, if you're going to say prenup, you've got to have all these considerations taken care of ahead of time before um, you do it. Um, so Abd Awad says, it's, we shouldn't even be talking about prenups anymore. Um, let's see. Um, let's talk about talaq. Oh, no, community property. So community property, I mentioned, is a problem for Muslim women and men in various ways. One argument I've heard many times is, well, I don't want to have community property in my marriage because I'm a Muslim woman and my property is my property. And I don't want him having a claim on half of my property. This is going to be more and more of an issue as Muslim in the United States are actually income earners and sometimes the main income earner for the family. So they're very, very many will say, well, I don't want to be in a community property situation where my, my, my marital property is getting divided halfway. You can opt out of community property with a valid prenuptial agreement. But again, again, we get back into making sure that you've written it in such a way that's appropriate. Um, 
the, interestingly enough, there's many arguments for the maher operating in similar ways to what the what community property tries to do. In, so, in fact, if the maher is an uh, amount that's given to the uh, given to the woman upon time of divorce, then fi that if it's a large amount, it could operate as a financial um, insurance for her to have some kind of ability to live on her own in the event of a divorce. So oftentimes people will say, well, the maher takes care of some of those considerations of what the U.S. law does under community property. However, if you're in a situation where the court is not recognizing your her, you could be in this interesting situation where you've opt out of community property and prenuptial agreement, and then your, the court will not recognize your mahar, and then you end up actually n neither having a Sharia-based acknowledgement or a secular-based one. Um, there are also arguments that I've seen um, about how Islamic law itself has the same kind of motivations that motivated community property in that Classically speaking, depending on, again, it has to do with rank and hierarchy of parties or whatever, but there's a basic principle that a woman has no obligation to do housework or cleaning or cooking or as, as an incident of marriage. It's not part of what a Muslim marriage requires a woman to do. In fact, if she comes from the kind of background that where women, people just didn't do that in the home, the husband is obligated under fiqh to either do it himself or provide for a maid and et cetera, et cetera. So the argument would then be that, well, anything that she did contribute during the marriage that was child rearing, homework, housework, should then be compensated at the time of divorce that could then equalize the same kind of argument. I mean, community property was largely motivated also by the one, one spouse is staying at home doing all of the home stuff while the other person went off and got a career. And so this is equalizing that. So these are classical FIC kinds of tools that you could do to do the same thing. But um, this is a level of FIC analysis that doesn't usually show up in these cases. Now, the more common case is, at least in the cases that are in there now, because it's a more traditional arrangement where the husband is actually the one with the more income and the wife usually doesn't have the more, that much income, what happens is the Muslim woman will often claim the marital property and not her mahar because she's going to end up getting more money under marital property, especially if it's a long marriage and there's a million dollars in marital assets and her mahar was, you know, $2,000 or something like that. The husband, on the other hand, will assert a recognition of Islamic law because the mahar is all he says he owes her. It's, well, we just agreed on $2,000 at the time of the marriage. I shouldn't have to give her community property. We're Muslims, you know? So there's many cases where it's flipped that way. So again, just last year, 2008, Alim versus Alim in Maryland, Court of Appeals, um, looking at the, this is mixed in with whether or not they're going to recognize a talaq, which is the unilateral divorce um, initiated by the husband. So there's a, a divorce case going on in Maryland. The husband goes over to Pakistan and then issues, does a f official, official talaq, whatever, we can hear the details of how you register a talaq in Pakistan, but he goes and he's, he gets some kind of certificate of the unilateral talaq divorce in Pakistan while the marriage pro divorce proceedings are going on continuously in Maryland. It comes back and says, we're divorced under Islamic law in Pakistan. You have to give full faith and credit to this divorce that we just got in Pakistan. And now the court's having to decide well, what about the marital property in Maryland? And it, it, does this talaq decree then extinguish all of marital property asset claims that she would have? And so then they have to decide whether they recognize a talaq divorce in, on top of everything else. So they, the court then ultimately doesn't recognize it on a couple of reasons. So one is to accept talaq and to accept the silence of the quote unquote contract signed by the wife on the day of her marriage in Pakistan as a waiver of her rights to marital property acquiring during the marriage is in direct conflict with our public policy. The strong sense of we in, in Maryland have decided that under a, a, on a marital property arrangement where the couple been married for a very long time, especially, she should have some claim over the assets. So on public policy grounds, using a talaq decree to extinguish a marital property claim in, in the states, they were not going to recognize it, which gets right into talaq itself. And that's where I'm going to end. Um, that very nice. Okay, so um, this idea of what the classical family law does say in the fake of the of a man having the ability to unilaterally divorce a wife upon no grounds, with no notice to the wife, and often the wife doesn't even have to be there. So wh whether or not that is fair and something that we should, as, as U.S. court, give full faith and credit to just because it's recognized in the other country. So the court, in the same case, Alim versus Alim, has to lo looks at this. They look at it under many areas, one especially under the Equal Rights Amendment of the Maryland Constitution, 1972. Didn't quite make it to the federal constitution, but in, at least in Maryland we have an Equal Rights Amendment. So. Um, they look at the fact, the details of how talaq happens, and they say, I'm sorry, this is a violation of a, a Maryland constitutional law. Talaq that says lacks any significant due process for the wife, and its use, moreover, directly deprives the wife of the due process she's entitled to when she initiates divorce litigation in this state. 
the enforceability of a foreign select divorce provision such as that presented here in the courts of Maryland where only the male, i.e. the husband, has an independent right to utilize talaq and the wife may utilize it only with the husband's permission, this is that de delegated divorce that, that we heard about yesterday, um, uh, is contrary to Maryland's constitutional provisions and thus contrary to the public policy of Maryland. So now we come full circle to what we heard yesterday about where the, uh, the unilateral one-way ticket of talaq being recognized in this other country despite very good, I think, Islamic law-based arguments for having another way of looking at talaq and access to the wife might, ha might have equal access to the talaq, the court is looking only at what's recognized by the state and looks at that as saying, well, that's unfair, and so we're not going to recognize it here. Now, how the, well, how the actual division of property comes down in the end, you can decide whether you think that justice was done. But all of this has to do with, and this is my conclusion, this is happening already. U.S. courts are already wrestling with what does Islamic law mean on this stuff. Often it is left to expert testimony, bringing in expert witnesses to say, what is mahar, what is this, and, try, and the court's trying to understand this. And these are, and by the way, any of you who are experts in this, it's quite lucrative if you want to make some extra money on the side. Um, you, that's, it's a quite popular way to try to figure this stuff out. Some parties want Muslim tribunals to be making these kinds of decisions. Why are we trying to convince a secular judge to try to figure this out? Non-Muslims might even agree with this. Why are we even in the business of trying to figure this out? Not all Muslims would want Muslim tribunals to figure this out. They want some kind of constitutional check or some kind of other equality check on this stuff. Either way, secular courts are wrestling with this stuff because it comes up as an individual-based right that the person is saying, based on my religious rights, I have this ability, I, I, I want to be able to enforce this. Um, I'm interested in the idea of some kind of recognition of, I don't have any answers for this, but some kind of legal pluralist way of accommodating all of these different facets of our society. Um, I like Anwar Iman at Toronto's idea of maybe some kind of tribunal, but it's multiple tribunals, not just one Muslim tribunal, but many different Muslim tribunals where you might have a variety of interpretations of what Islamic law requires in these circumstances. And so one of these tribunals might say, yeah, unilateral divorce is valid. Another one might say no. And then we might actually see some real innovative fiqh happening in a Western context where the gender roles are quite different, and you actually, if it's recognized with respect by the Muslim community, you might actually have that circling back around and informing the secular courts that are trying to wrestle with this stuff and saying, you know what, this might not be the only way that Islamic law deals with this question. Interesting, in one of the cases, I don't remember which one, one of the cases said, we are only, by the way, we're only looking at Islamic law as it is applied in a Muslim-majority country under legislation. We will not apply Islamic law as, quote, a religious canon. So this idea of fiqh, as Muslims often think about it, is not restricted by the legislated versions in these Muslim countries. We think of fiqh as this you know, greater entity that is dynamic and organic and evolving. That's not being looked at by some of these US courts. US courts want the empirical, you know, on paper kind of version. So anyway, I have no answers here, but I think that there's a lot of potential for pluralism. There's a lot of potential for misunderstanding. There's a lot of potential for judgment. Um, and there's a lot of potential for creativity. Thank you. That, that was great and, and quite concrete. And it had, I thought, was very interesting to see how the liberal democratic notion of fairness interacted with the question of expectations that vary by cultures, and that that's part of the problem here, that there are different expectations. And uh, that leads to the indeterminacy kinds of things that Daniel was talking about. Things become indeterminate because expectations are so different in the various cultures. So that was just utterly fascinating and a nice compliment to what we just heard. Our third speaker is Denise Helley. Uh, the Institut National de Recherche Scientifique, and she is going to go over there. <laughs> okay, so I will be presenting some result, preliminary result, and very empirical result from a research uh, we are doing in uh, Quebec for researcher. It's about the treatment of Islam by judge in uh, Ontario, Quebec, Spain, and UK. And the case concern are only family case, so family conflict. So we have a four researcher. And we have also four objectives. And I will focus only today on the third objective, the possible cultural bias of judge when referring to Islamic practice, cultural practice, value, and law. We have also three other objectives. You can look at it. And uh, some 
new objective are just appearing, especially something I think would be very interesting. It's a conflict between judicial body and uh, department about the way to treat, for example, repudiation uh, or to treat adoption. So we can see that, especially in the case of Spain. Uh, methodology, let's just forget about it. Uh, the context, let's forget about it. We don't have time for that. Now, what, is, uh, what are the data? The data we are right now, we have selected for 157 cases for Muslim migrant unconverted born in Quebec. Country of origin of migrant, almost 50% from uh, Maghreb, as you can see. The conflict, uh, mostly divorce, um, and a lot of uh, marriage abroad, some kafala case, and other form of case of con family conflict. Uh, I, I have read all, um, up to now only 53 of the case uh, really selected for the analysis. And um, I read 104, and 50, half of them really contain explicit references to, by the party to a Muslim value. So it means that there are half of the case uh, involving Muslim uh, person, let's say, who did not refer to Islam at all and just come to the civil court in Quebec to resolve the family uh, conflict. Uh, it's interesting also, don't forget I'm not a jurist, I'm an anthropologist and a sociologist, so I'm always interested of the, um, by the behavior of uh, ethnic or religious uh, minority. And so there is no differences according to the country of origin of the length of residence that are in the lands of residence in Quebec uh, for all the cases we are studying. Now, what about the judgment, uh, the judge uh, treatment? The bias, in a sense, uh, takes a several forms. The, for the first one is a lot, in some cases, of unnecessary comments by the judge. So you can find unnecessary comments in any case, but in case involving uh, Muslim, we have very negative comments in a sense. So we have some example here. I think that the first one is pretty nasty. For example, and uh, you have a lot. Uh, what uh, appear right now, but we have to look really more seriously to the case, that some judge are very clean. I, can, I will not give the name here and never give the name, but some judge are very clean while they're treating the Muslim case. Other ones are just making comments you cannot believe. It. So unnecessary comments, for example, something I found extremely disturbing, they are this really mentioning the way the party met. So, of course, as you have this Muslim system of marriage, of cousin marriage, it means in Quebec that this is very bad practice to marry a cousin, really. So, they can give you a lot of detail of how the party met and marry, and, and, and in general, they are just pointing to the fact that they are arranged marriage. They are not free will marriage. And they don't know anything about, and the party, did not speak about that at all. They don't say, I was forced to marry this man, not at all. So this is a, a way. You have also other way to tendentious comment. I have to, to go uh, very quickly. Another form of bias is what I call, and perhaps it's a wrong word, over argumentation. So especially in case of repudiation, judge already have a lot of arguments to not recognize this type of divorce and its effects in Quebec. But on top of this uh, argument, legal argument, in general, the most important is the fact that the party have been residing in Quebec for years, so there is no, comp no way to follow a foreign tribunal. 
But on top of that, they refer to the notion of public order most of the time, and in this case, public order, it's gender equality. So this is a poem for, for us of bias. Uh, premise and value of the judge, very obvious one, if you have an anthropological look. Um, th they speak a lot. This is a buzzword of integration. So, an integration means for the judge adoption of local ways of life. And they speak of integration only for women and children, never for men. So, it looks like men, Muslim men are out of reach. They will never be integrated, it looks like. But we can transform women and children. So you can see an example of how to be really integrated, mean to be a North American, especially for a woman, not wearing a scarf, walking outside her home, and all these stereotypes we know very, very well. Another form of bias uh, or cultural uh, premises is uh, they insist, especially a female judge, insist a lot about the protection of rights of women, which is normal. But the demand, the house, the demand for women, Muslim women, autonomy. And there is a lot of material of data and example we can give about this form of cultural bias. Uh, for example, uh, I, uh, we love this case. Two immigrants of Iranian origin got engaged. They want to live together for a while to get to know each other before, uh, better before the civil marriage in Quebec. To confront the Muslim morals, they decide to get married in a religious ceremony. Four months after the wedding, the woman said she was stricken. She thought the religious ceremony was also a legal civil marriage. She demanded compensation for damage to her reputation. The judge said she had, in bad faith, he refused to grant her any money uh, and compensation. Uh, we have. A, for example, uh, they also point to the fact that the Muslim woman must be autonomous and must uh, really uh, take their, the effect of the decision very seriously. So, for example, this case regarding a woman who wanted to divorce because her husband's economic circumstances were not what she was expecting. Uh, what is also interesting, it's the way they treat a woman converted to Islam. For example, um, a, a lot of converted women said that they did not understand what was happening when they marry a Muslim, or they did not expect to be controlled. Uh, and their day-to-day -day practice and value. And they complain about that they ask for annulment of the marriage. In all the cases we have been reading, the judge say, no way, you are in bad faith, really. And uh, this is a very good uh, case uh, here. Okay. Another case uh, of a convert, a Catholic woman who married a Muslim man in Manuel, it's exactly the kind of example, a typical example. Two years later, she requests an old man of the marriage because she said she was tricked by her spouses. And before the wedding, he assured her that no religious practices of his, or Islamic custom would be imposed on her. But after the wedding, his family put pressure on her to the contrary. And the judge, you can read uh, really the judge um, vocabulary. In French, a shift mall is a very strong uh, word. Uh, red rack and uh, okay. And what is interesting is making a mistake about character is not a cause for annulment of marriage in Quebec. So, if you were wrong and chose a bad guy, forget it. Okay. Now, cultural determinism by the judge, it's something uh, a lot of others have pointed to. 
So the church really thinks that Muslim culture and society are lifetime from which it's very difficult to escape. And they are, in a sense, um, pitying women, Muslim women. They have also the sense that the culture is a very close universe, not an open range of interpretation, but actor. And it's most amazing, not when they speak about Muslim culture practices, but when they speak about Quebecers, French Canadian culture. They're all French Canadians are supposed to act the same way. So the French Canadian culture, it's conceived by the judge as a very close culture too. So this is a real uh, stereotype of culture. Ultra secularism, I will not insist uh, on it because we have already had two papers about that, but this is a case. Uh, so it's a couple who get married before a Muslim celebrant in a mosque. Uh, and the judge says the religious wedding was never denounced to the civil authority. What is this kind of vocabulary? Is it a dangerous uh, a religious marriage? Is something dangerous against the society? So you can see how they develop a form of this, a form of uh, Republican French uh, ultra secularisms. Now about formatting and concluding, I'm going very quickly. Uh, formatting Islam, I must say I have some problem with uh, the word expression because almost all Christian, all Christian religion has been formatted by modernity, so Islam will be formatted by modernity also. What is interesting in the case we have is that one of the central principles of resolving conflict between parents regarding the education and custody of the children is that of the best interest of the child, such as the right to know about his or her cultural origin or to be exposed to the culture of both parents. So as we have uh, several cases of converted women married to Muslim mi migrants, we have some uh, very strange um, situation. As on a part, a uh, church conceive of integration at the adoption of local way of life. This is not congruent with the best interest of the child to be exposed to both parent culture. So what it means, in, in fact, is that religion is thought, as we have seen in other paper, is thought as a, a reference for personal identity, but with no significant value of particular behavior attached to it. Girl can be Muslim, but they, they will not dress like, uh, they have to dress like local girls, they have to work like local girls, they have to marry like, local, they have to act like North American girls. So it means that not only must Islam be privatized, but it must be invisible. It's what really we call for the disappearance of religion from the public sphere. So we know about that, but it's a bit uh, disturbing to find it in the discourse of judge. Uh, another stuff, uh, which also is very well known, is uh, really the ways that kafala is treated, is treated by judge, and family law judge in Quebec, it's uh, breaking the affiliation, absolutely. They are giving, they are really going around in any, all the ways they can find in the um, legal apparatus to transform kafala in a, into adoption. And doing that for an anthropologist and you know about that, it's really breaking the sense and meaning of all the cosmogony about filiation. And I think this is a way of formatting a religion and a culture, a very serious one. So this is uh, all. What I find pretty interesting, and I'm, I already, already said it, is a conflict between judicial body and department. For example, the most significant case is in Spain. Immigration officer refused 
the definition, uh, refuse kafala as adoption. Some judge, family law, just say we can transform kafala into adoption. We have the same in Quebec. The commission, I don't know, you, we can translate la commission de protection de la jeunesse, youth protection uh, commission, refused to recognize kafala as adoption. Family law judge, try by all ways to transform it into adoption. So this is an interesting um, topic, I think, in the research. Another one, but we, I think it's impossible really to, to check uh, something. It's um, which group really go mostly to the tribunals? For example, are more, uh, Maghreb going more to the uh, civil court in Quebec than Pakistani? I don't think we can check. Uh, we can have a lot of hypotheses, but I don't think we can check it. So this is uh, what uh, we are just uh, right now um, just finding uh, as a, this primary preliminary result. And I think it's pretty disturbing to see that uh, I'm not finished reading all the case, but it looks like more than half of the case contains some very, very disturbing comments. Thank you. That was great. Some wonderful empirical materials to bring to bear on what we were talking about. Uh, and I think it really helped illuminate some of the issues. And it's also nice to see Canada mentioned because I always, in, since I've written on Canada, I always like to hear stuff about it. Uh, our fourth speaker uh, is uh, going to talk uh, in a moment. And it's Musa uh, Abu Ramadan from Brzezit University. And you want to speak here. Okay, so I will get out of the way. Thanks. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I will use this primitive uh, machine. <laughs> okay. so I want to speak here. Okay. So I, I will speak about uh, Sharia or Islamic law uh, in Israel. Uh, and uh, there are also some secular court which are dealing with Sharia and also religious court which deal with Sharia. But before, before starting my, uh, my presentation, I want just uh, to make a preliminary uh, remark, two pre uh, preliminary remarks. One on the institutional level. So who, who are the institutions who are dealing with Sharia in Israel. And the second remark is on substantive level. What do we mean by Sharia in Israel? I hope it will not be counted by time, but okay. So uh, from the institutional level, we have a secular court in Israel. In the secular courts which are dealing with, the, with the Sharia, we have a Supreme Court, Supreme Court. We have also jurisdiction who are uh, submitted to the Supreme Court, District Court. Uh, here we have also Family Court, Secular Family Court in Israel. We have also other courts uh, who are submitted also to the Supreme Court, Labor Court. And we have another uh, uh, system which is uh, religious uh, So we have also another uh, system, which is parallel system, which is religious system. We have, uh, in the religious system in Israel, we have a non-official religious court, non-official. And we have official religious court. In the non-official religious court, we have the Christian court all the Christian uh, domination which are recognized. 
And in the official religious court, we have three categories in Israel. We have rabbinical court, we have a Sharia court, and also Druze court. Non-official and official here, the, the court, the rabbinical Sharia and Druze court are established by the state by law. Here, the non-official court are not, are not established by law. They are recognized by, by law, but the establishment of this court are, are done by the canonical law, the, the, the law of the church. You don't have a law who say to the church how to organize themselves. There is a, a religious uh, uh, ecclesiastical law who organize itself. So from the institutional level, we have Sharia court. Sharia court are state court, official court. They are organized by the state. They receive the money from the state. They are also submitted to the rules and ethics of the professional ethics of the state judge. Here also we have control of the, the secular court, mainly Supreme Court. We have it control the religious court. If there is a deviation from the jurisdiction, the Supreme Court controls the Sharia court. And also, sometimes also the, there are some uh, competition and influence, indirect influence between Sharia court and family court. Family civil court in Israel have a, a competition in jurisdiction. There is parallel jurisdiction in some matter. So it influenced directly the matter uh, in Sharia court, the, the rulings in Sharia court. Sharia court tried to say, come to us, we are more Muslim here. Family court say, come to us, we are more liberal. So we can see that there is competition and there is a change. I, I, I wrote many articles to see how this, uh, uh, each court wants to, to have more clients. So this is the institutional level, okay? Here also, if we want to focus on Sharia court in Israel, appeals court, there is appeal court and first degree court. For the appeals court in Jerusalem, we have three, Sharia, three appeals court in Jerusalem. One is in Israel, is in West Jerusalem. One Sharia court is in East Jerusalem, is, is a Jordanian court from Jordani. And one is in East East Jerusalem, it is outside Jerusalem. It is, is a Palestinian Sharia court. And here also there is a competition. For, for, so Sharia court have different competition. One with the family court within Israel. So it is this field, you must compete with them. And another field, you must compete also with a Palestinian and Jordanian. Uh, if we compare these three Sharia court, appeal court, the, the Sharia court of uh, uh, Israel have the, the authority of the state. We can execute the decision. The Jordanian court has the prestigious uh, court because they are educated in Sharia law. And uh, uh, the Palestinians who are East, East Jerusalem, outside Jerusalem, have uh, the legitimacy, national legitimacy, because it is a court of, uh, created by a Palestinian authority after 1994. Uh, so he, here it is the institutional level, okay? So the second remark, the second remark is on, on a substantive level. What is the law apply? What, what do we mean by Sharia, Sharia in Israel? What is Sharia in Israel? I, I think it means three categories of things, three categories of different things. The, the Israeli, the Sharia court must apply three different things. One is a codified, Islamic law, which is Ottoman family law, which was codified, it is still applied in Israel, and also in Lebanon. Ottoman family law, codified Islamic law. The second category is Sharia, uh, where, where it, it is not codified, for example, in matter of alimony uh, for children, there is no codification, so it is a, a classical, classical Sharia. And the third category is uh, adoption of law, because the, the, the Knesset also adopt many laws which apply uh, to uh, Muslim and also to Jews and Christians. This is a territorial law applying to all population in Israel. So here is, is the Israeli legislation. So, so here, here in substantive level, the Sharia court should apply all these three things. So now uh, I will start my presentation. <laughs> uh, so uh, my presentation discussed the relationship between the Sharia court in Israel and the state of Israel. It argues that the Sharia courts employ a discourse that obscures their position within 
Так же, как и здесь. Employee discourse that obscures their position within the state of Israel by portraying themselves as autonomous institution that implement the Sharia in a complete and perfect way. This discourse is based on the notion that there exists a pure Sharia devoid of any secular Israeli territorial law or any other non-Muslim religious law for that matter. Such a discourse, however, is incompatible with the legal reality inside Israel. It ignores the process of secularization that have for over a century diminish the purity of the Sharia applied in the territory that has become the state of Israel. The secularization process began as it did in many Arab countries with the Ottoman codification of the Sharia in the early 20th century. The codification process gave the state a set of laws that it could order the religious authorities to enforce, thus diminishing the power of the religious establishment ulama to articulate religious norms. A special form of secularization referred here as Israelization began after 48, when the state of Israel replaced some religious personal status law with territorial civil law among the Muslim community and other minor minority in Israel. The, Israel. the Israeli Sharia court has not only ignored this reality, but has resorted to the process of Islamization to mask it and bolster its own discourse instead. Islamizations occur when secular Israeli legal norm are repackaged as norms that already exist in Islamic law and are applied in Sharia accord as pure, authentic Islamic law. So here there is a process of Islamization when law, Israeli law, is taken and, and, and presented in another way that it is Islamic. Thus the process of Israelization and Islamization are actually dialectical and occur simultaneously. As the Israelization of the Sharia accord increases, so does the process of Islamization. The Islamization of Israeli civil law was intended to strengthen the Muslim community inside Israel by presenting it as governed at least in matters of personal status by autonomous courts applying authentic Islamic law. The actual, actual consequence of Islamization, however, have generally increased state control over the Sharia court. First, the courts accept and apply codified Ottoman family law, denying their own power to establish the personal status norms that govern their community. The Israeli territorial law repackaged as Islamic is also often at odds with classical Islamic law. Finally, in the case of the work or endowment property, Islamization has legitimated the dispossession of Islamic holy places. I do not argue that secularization has rendered the law applied in Sharia court an Islamic, or that it is impossible for an Islamic legal system to exist inside a secular, non-Muslim state. What it does argue is that Israeli advocates of the Sharia court must acknowledge what is actually happening with their jurisdiction as well as honestly address the compromises that a religious court must make in order to operate within a secular state and the consequence of these compromises on the religious community. This presentation also has implication outside of Israel context as a case study of the application of Islamic law in a secular state, as well as the changes that must be made and restriction that must be applied to make this possible. So first of all, I want just to take some exam example uh, within the rulings of Sharia court, how the court uh, perceived itself. Uh, I, I will make some quotation. Uh, in one ruling, the, court, the Sharia court says, it is necessary to note that the civil law on which the court below, basically dependent in its decision regarding temporary alimony, has nothing to do with the law that applies to Sharia court, because it does not apply the Muslim, as the Sharia court is prohibited to judge according to the law which are not derived from the Muslim law. So all the law, Israeli law, which applies to Muslim, the Sharia court will not recognize them. And another decision, the, there are uh, uh, ma many decisions in this. Uh, this is just an example. The court say here we, we repeat and confirm that the Sharia Court of Appeals applies the Orthodox Sharia, and it sees the Sharia as a full and comprehensive judicial system. We have explained this several times. So we have the Sharia, so we, ha we have uh, Quran, Sunnah, we have God, Quran, Sunnah, and uh, the Qadi, the Sharia Court. We don't have all the development of 14th century, uh, Ottoman, Israel, we have just Qadi and God. So we don't have a recognition, it is, it is uh, 
the non-recognition of the historical development of Islamic law. And this, this image that is perceived, by, that is uh, represented by uh, Sharia court is not correct. It's not correct because the process of Islamic law is a process of secularization. And secularization here have two uh, sense. One sense of the secularization is the process of codification, because mainly the main part of family law is already codified. And the other process of codification is simply uh, deleting Islamic law, and it is Israeli, Israeli uh, legislation. So the Sharia court didn't take in account uh, uh, this uh, uh, development. So concerning the codification, the codification, uh, uh, the, the codification, it is, you know, as some people say that the codification, it is, it is Isla Islamic law, but it is written in a different way. It is organized through article, but it is the substantive, the substance is the substance of law, uh, of Islamic law. There are ma many uh, debates about uh, this uh, aspect of uh, codification. Uh, is codification Islamic law or not? There are many, many uh, discussions. In Saudi Arabia, for example, they think that codification itself is against Islamic law. But there, are, there were also other discussions. I, I will give, I will give uh, just one example, a uh, discussion between uh, two scholars, uh, one scholar in 19th century and the, and the king of Egypt. And it, it is quoted in uh, uh, Rashid Rida, uh, Al-Manar, and he's saying this, Report. Ali Basha Rifa'a talks about a conversation that he had with the Khadif Ismail. Khadif Ismail tell to him, you have had education at Al-Azhar and you can persuade them, the French, you have rights and many de uh, dealings in this country and there are claims between them and the local people. The French complain to me that they do not know how they will be tried in their claims or claims against them and how they can defend themselves especially that the books of Islamic law, according to which our ulama are working, are complicated, and there are lots of disagreement on them. Therefore, ask the ulama of Al-Azhar to compile a book on Sharia, civil law, that will be like the books of laws, and elaborate the clauses of the law and trial, and that we will have no disagreement am among the judge in their decision, and if they do not do that, tell them that you will act according to Napoleon French code. So this is an appeal to codified Islamic law. Ali Basha said that his father answered him, answered the Khadif saying, Sir, I traveled to Europe and studied there, and I was minister in the government and translated many books from French into Arabic. I grew old and rich this age, and no one had doubts in my religiousness. If I suggest this suggestion, to the ulama of Al-Azhar by order of my master, I am afraid they will say that Sheikh Rifa'a has become an apostate, Ertadda, from Islam in his last days, because he caused the change of books of Sharia and changed the Sharia into positive books. I ask my master to relieve me of this mission because I do not want to expose myself to such a thing before my death and do not want them to say he died as a kafir, Amphidah. So this is one of perception of codification is a kufr, is infidelity. I, I will not go uh, to this extreme point, but one thing is, is, is sure, the codification is uh, uh, Islamic law, which is, which is a classical Islamic law, and Islamic law, which is codified, it is not the same thing. In, in codification, we, re we make redistribution of the power. So the ulama are not producing the law. The state is producing the law. It is a, it is a, a great change in, in Islamic law. So here, when we say codification, it is, it is one step more in the, in the step of secularization. Although if we agree that codification is still Islamic law, but the, 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 the state control more. So to, to support this point, uh, I, I, I check the, the cases of, you know, in the Supreme Court. When the Supreme Court has to deal with a codified Islamic law, the control is more strict because for Israeli Supreme Court, a codified Islamic, a codified Islamic law is a, a, a codified Islamic law is a secular law and it has jurisdiction to control it. 
When it, it becomes to classical uh, Islamic law, which is not codified, the control of the court is less strict. So the codification is uh, enhanced the process of secularization. So one, this is one point. And another point is more easy. Another point is when, when there is a lot of legislation, Israeli legislation, who are de deleting the, the Sharia, for example, the, age, the marriage age, uh, uh, the, uh, the polygamy, uh, the unilateral divorce. Uh, there is also, for example, in, in Waqf property was expropriated. So in all fields that the Sharia uh, uh, court has jurisdiction, it was deleted. So it is, it is coquivid, I don't know how to translate it. it is, there is more hole th than cheese. So there is a lot of interference of Israeli. So there is no pure uh, comprehensive Sharia as it is presented. So the first process is secularization. And the, the second process which is happening here in, in Sharia court, it is a reaction. It is a reaction, it is Islamization. The Sharia court want, want uh, to react First of all, it does not recognize the Israeli legislation, and it makes is Islamization. It takes some rules. For example, I will, I will give uh, one example. Uh, for example, for the, court, for the rule of custody, according to Israeli law and according also to Western law, the, 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 pri the primary principle in uh, custody is the best interest of the child. The Fukaha recognize sometimes the best interest of the, of, of the interest of the child, but it is not the same thing. It is the same word, but the content is different. Because in, in thick, thick the text, there is a gender uh, basis, there is difference between men and women, there is a lot of things who are, doesn't which does not exist in Western and Israeli law. And the Sharia say, the best interest of the child, it is, it, we are not obliged to rely on Israeli law because it is already recognized in uh, Islamic law, so, so it is a process of Islamization. So uh, to save the face, we are, we are not applying Israeli law, we are applying Muslim law, but uh, we, with, with making reinterpretation of uh, Islamic law. So uh, another uh, uh, example of, uh, uh, two minutes, yeah. another example of Islamization, it is uh, uh, the, in the Waqf, Waqf, Waqf property are, are endowment, religious endowment, which were funded for many years, and the State of Israel expropriated all the endowment. And uh, the Qadi react against this endowment, but, the, but all the endowment was, was already dispossessed. And they, they, they uh, 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 sign a decree making prohibition to sell any waqf, but there is no waqf. So this is, this is a mechanism of uh, reacting against this disposition, but there is no waqf. Uh, so uh, in conclusion, what is the conclusion? In conclusion, so uh, the discourse that is created by Sharia court argues that there is a clear separation between Islamic and secular law in Israel, that it is theological and legal and ep epistemological. This presentation reveals that this claim is misleading. At the very least, the boundaries between religious and secular law in Israel are fluid, socially and politically delineated, and often misleading. For contrary to what they claim, the Sharia court does not apply the Sharia in a pure way, it doesn't exist. Indeed, there has never been a pure Islamic law. Instead, Islamic law has influenced and been influenced by various cultures. Islamic law has gone through a process of secularization, and not only in Israel. Within the state of Israel, there are religious courts that are expected to apply a pure form of religious law. This presentation has demonstrated that such expectations are not often met, and that to understand the nature of law, identity, and citizenship in Israel, the border between the secular and the sacred need to be readjusted to match the complex and often contradictory reality on the ground. Thank you. I'd like to have some questions. So if we could, uh, I think let's collect some questions uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll have some answers. So if everybody up here could write down the questions so that they know what they are. I'm, I see some people with their hands up. I'm just gonna say one thing quickly, which is, Daniel told us that maybe going to procedure was the answer, but we've learned there's all sorts of different expectations. We've learned that the interpretations can be quite at variance with what we might expect. And we've learned that the complexities of various courts uh, here, uh, and that, that doesn't look like there's sort of an easy procedural answer. So is procedure the answer would be my question. And it's not clear to me after hearing all the speakers. Let's get some other questions. Yes, right there and then right to the right, to the left in the white shirt.
So let's get a few more questions and then we'll try to answer them. So I'll let Hedy, you right there and then I'll let you choose. <laughs> you have to know the code to turn on the microphone, it turns out. I don't know, I just, it looks more complicated than it should be. <laughs> yeah, I think it is now. Can you hear me? Um, one, one issue that I, I see here um, 
is that if we look at this from not only an Islamic basis, but a contractual basis on the issue of divorce, one of your quotes that you had was that um, the respondents were confused about Sharia law and Quran being principles of law and ideas as opposed to law, whereas there are some people that if they living a quote unquote Islamic life and living life for, by Quran, there's a whole chapter on women called Nisa. And in that chapter, they address how women are to be treated on divorce, in marriage, and what have you. And when a person is coming into a quote, contractual basis with that understanding, and you have the quote unquote meeting of the minds, why is it that in the breach of the contract by whatever party it is, that person is not given the, um, I don't know the verbiage to, to use for that. Why are they not given that basis on the breach of the contract in the, in the, in the eyes of the court? It just doesn't make any sense. Okay, let's take one more question and then we'll go to some answers. Maybe. <laughs> We've been talking uh, about uh, conflicts between Muslims and Muslims within the court, but now we have also the occurrences where uh, secular uh, agencies, for example, an insurance company, a case that is active right now, is actually bringing Islamic law against the two parties uh, based on negligence. Uh, they did not give advice to the uh, husband and wife as relating to uh, the possible um, uh, lack of brain development in the fetus, and the fetus was born uh, a natural birth, uh, but it's handicapped, and therefore there is negligence from the insurance company. So the insurance company is arguing that had they told the two, uh, the two Muslim uh, parents that they would not have approved an abortion, and therefore, even if they informed them, they would not have been able to actually carry forth with the abortion, and therefore they should not be held liable uh, on the basis of Sharia. So how we could actually here see that even a insurance agency making that argument and bringing a, an expert to actually say that this is, would be the case uh, in Islamic law post 120 days because the discovery of uh, the lack of brain connection was post 120 days. So I'm just going to go from left to right here, Asifa, if you want to start, and then we'll go down the panel and provide answers to this melange of very interesting questions. Yeah, I'm going to have to think about that, that one a long time, because it, it affects not just Muslims, but anybody on an abortion issue. I mean, it's, that's a big one. Um, just to briefly, um, lessons to Muslims um, you know, in, in the United States dealing with how the, looking at how the U.S. courts have dealt with this. Of course, it depends on the state, because the courts have dealt with it different ways in different states. So there's not one main thing other than being very careful, being very clear. I don't think that these, the, the form marriage contracts that are often given out by mosques that, that are very vague in the, you know, blank lines and, and, you know, making some reference to, you know, the law of God and his prophet, but not anything more specific, um, ultimately just throws the question back into the courts and you have a much more messy trying to resolve it later. So um, that, I think, is uh, just a lesson that um, I think needs, you have to be as clear in a Muslim marriage contract as you are in any contract if you want it to be recognized later on. Um, I've noticed more and more local imams insisting on couples getting a civil marriage license as well as some kind of religious ceremony. Um, and more and more imams getting themselves approved, accredited by ever whatever means um, to avoid that conflict and refusing to officiate a marriage contract, a marriage ceremony that hasn't gone through the civil stuff. Not every imam does that. You have, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of mosques around in the country and there, there are going to be a variety of, of ways to do it. But that's one result that I have noticed more and more imams more educated about the U.S. legal system and then carrying that back into how they officiate stuff. Um, um, why not both a mahar and equal division of, uh, uh, why not, why wouldn't a woman say, I want my mahar and I want community property? The, I, I don't, as, as a, as a strategy matter, as a lawyer, I don't see why you couldn't do that. And you could, the, the question is, how consistent is it as an Islamic legal argument? So if somebody's arguing their rights under Islamic law, 
the further maher, a natural response from the husband, especially if the marital assets are much higher than the maher, the marital uh, the, uh, the husband will then say, well, okay, if you're arguing Islamic law, you just get your maher. There is no such thing as marital property in Islamic law, and so therefore we're done. So it usually creates an oppositional relationship between those two claims. That doesn't necessarily have to be, because like you said, there are very creative ways to argue under Islamic law that I have some claim over the assets that have been acquired over the duration of the marriage. It may not be the exact same analysis analysis is a pure marital property analysis, but it might be some other one. But it takes a lot more in-depth creative work at a fiqh, you know, Islamic legal doctrine level that usually is difficult for the courts to do, secular court to do. So, um, and so that's why in the cases that I've looked at, they, look, they, they, they go at odds to each other um, because it's, it's usually looked at in a very flat kind of, you know, what does Islamic law say? Okay, let's incorporate that and we'll make a judgment. So. I, don't, I still don't see why doesn't the, as a strategy, what's, what's the U.S., what is the, say, state of California legal problem with wanting both? Okay, it sets up a conflict, fine. But, you know, isn't the, isn't the woman on, on sound legal grounds? It, uh, as, as a matter of U.S. law, I mean, as far as if the parties agree to um, the, the meher itself in the marriage contract and the court is of the mind to say we recognize agreements between two parties and the fact that it's religious in nature is not going to bother us, then they'll probably enforce it. If there's some kind of uncomfortableness of, well, it's a religious agreement, we don't know, we're the state enforcing religious stuff, that you've seen some courts be nervous about that. Um, and again, it's all over the map. I mean, different states have done different things. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, two things. One, actually, in response to what you were saying in your, in your sort of envoi for the discussion, uh, the, the, the idea, I mean, the idea that, that, that we have to somehow come up with some kind of procedure that will allow us to have the voices that need to be heard heard in order for um, some kind of acceptable way of, of balancing out all of these different values, um, you know, for, for this to, to be done in an acceptable way, it doesn't mean that these, the, those institutions actually exist. I mean, the, the, the stuff that we heard from Denise uh, during her presentation suggests that any pretension that actual courts in Quebec, at least, and I imagine Quebec isn't alone in the world in this respect, any pretension that judges might have of being sort of incarnations of pure judicial reason, neutral of any cultural biases and assumptions, needs to really be revisited. And so we have to, even if we think, we're thinking about the courts, we have to really um, you know, be, be careful about thinking that the, the injunction to go procedural means that whatever procedures we happen to have will, will, be, will, be, will be good. So with respo in, re in response to, to Michael's question, um, I mean, the, the Boyd Report is a, is, a, is a weird document in many ways because, uh, I mean, for those, I really recommend reading it because it is a very, very good faith attempt at dealing with some very difficult issues, but it's constructed in a very awkward way. So it's not clear what flows from what. The, 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 the types of things like this that I've been involved in the, in the writing of, uh, both directly and indirectly with Taylor Bouchard, perhaps because of my professional deformation as a philosopher, recommendations actually kind of are, flow directly from some kind of an argument that proceeds. And here you have this thing where you have her own analysis, her own analysis of the constitutional um, uh, sort of uh, things, her analysis of the broader political moral issues, then a bunch of recommendations that were made to her by all the various groups and people that she talked to. And then you have a section of 45 recommendations that are just literally listed one after the other that don't seem to flow naturally from an argument that preceded it. So one of the things, so it, it, you're right, it, it, it consists in a number of amendments, not only to the Arbitration Act, but to the Family Law Act. Um, and one of them has to do with transparency. So there's a long, long list of things that need to be done in order for the proceedings of uh, religious, or, well, religious arbitrations in particular, uh, to be uh, recorded, you know, in a public way and stuff like that. Now, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll pin my colors to the, to the mast a little bit more. I sort of, you know, hid behind a kind of, I'm gonna tell you what, what's going on and I'm not gonna take a position. There are two ways in which this could be seen as wanting. One would be because it distorts the, adjudicate, the arbitration process, right? It makes arbitration more difficult. We, can, we know about ways, you know, we've all read John Elster, or if we haven't, I recommend it, ways in which too much publicity can actually um, inhibit people from saying all that needs to be said in a judicial hearing in order for a resolution to be arrived at. If that's the case, then I say there's a problem, right? If it turns out that consequentially we've made arbitration more difficult, I think we've sort of cut the, you know, done something sort of cut the nose, what, you know, cut the branch, cut the nose, whatever. Um, if it's a problem from the point of view, I mean, I do think that if, if the problem is, look, um, 
religious considerations, when they are made to be transparent in this way, are distorted. There I actually have less of an issue. I have less of a problem because I think that to some degree, uh, you know, the, the legal formatting of religious argument is something that is sort of part and parcel of what you get yourself into when you enter into a judicial process like arbitration. So to the extent that the former problem is your issue, I'm with you. To the extent that it's the latter and your body language suggests that it isn't, I'm a little bit more comfortable, perhaps, than some people might be, with the requirement of a kind of legal formatting of religious argument in judicial uh, processes. Uh, yes, uh, two clarification uh, concerning the, I will start by the second. Uh, you said that uh, Hatem, you said that the uh, agent and Suresh can could can, can, uh, uh, use the Islamic uh, argument. I think this is a, this is a problematic because uh, we are dealing with Islamic law in, in uh, Western country when the parties themselves are using, are want to use Islamic law, and th there is a question if the court should accept or not, there is a mechanism to accept or not public order or, or human right. But here, uh, uh, could we accept that the court will impose, if we, they have two Muslims, the, the court will use ex officio without asking by the party Islamic law, this is more problematic. If we have two Jews, uh, they will use uh, religious, uh, Jewish law and I think when, when uh, the party are invoking a culturalist uh, argument, uh, it could be dealt by, by the court with public order and other mechanisms. But when the court use uh, the cultural argument, I, I am I'm personally against, and it is against liberal democracy to, to, get, to assignate uh, identity uh, to each person. So this is one, one, one thing. Uh, Another, another question was a clarification concerning the divorce. Uh, yes, uh, the divorce <laughs> in Islamic law is, uh, as, uh, is accepted. By women can divorce, uh, but there are different uh, uh, causes for divorce, different reasons for, for divorce between different uh, schools. So. No? No. Do you have no comments? OK, well, let's get one or two more questions, and then we'll try to end up. Thank you. I have a question for uh, uh, Musa Abu Ramadan. I was just wondering, as Shuyukh from the Middle East uh, shows or feels, of course, uh, concern about political matters dealing with Israeli-Palestinian relation, uh, do, do they show the same interest uh, dealing with religious questions? For instance, do, do you have any Saudi clerics that has a droit de regard on what happened in the, the Islamic courts in, in Israel, and do they, do they use it? Yeah. Yes, uh, the problem of trois de regard in, in what's happened in Sharia court, I filed two petitions in the Supreme Court to have this trois de regard. After I published uh, several articles, uh, Sharia court closed the archive. So I filed a petition and, uh, in 2004, and uh, the, the, after two years, uh, the Supreme Court, Israeli Supreme Court, decides that I have the right uh, to, uh, to to read uh, the rulings, but I didn't read it until now. I didn't read. Uh, so, so I filed another petition, and there is another. It will be uh, uh, in in July. So, the problem of of uh, of uh, Sharia court. It is not just Sharia court. It's Arab law in general. If, even for for normal normal or civil law, it is a secret law. The law in Arab world, it is a secret. Not, not Sharia, not, not, not just Sharia uh, law. So, unfortunately, this is the situation. Yes, this is for Asifa and for Musa. Has there been any attempt uh, among Muslim scholars to extend, uh, go beyond the mahar to allow for the common property? Or uh, I know there's the mu'akhar. Some people look at that as kind of a um, a way to offset the possibility of divorce, but there's nothing particular in the Quran that would, would challenge extending to common property. And in a modern world, the whole notion of, uh, you know, a woman is always going to be cared for by her male relative is no longer a reality. So is there any attempt among Muslim scholars to, to revisit that? Um, sound like a mamina, by the way. Um, <laughs> uh, old friend. Um, yeah, I, I wish there were more. I think it's probably going to happen. Um, 
I, I mean, you have to, uh, as, as you're pointing out, all of the classical law operates against the context where there's other laws that are going to happen when this piece doesn't, this, this happens, and then there's an assumption that the male relatives are responsible for her. And if you're living in a, in a place where I can't then go to my brother and say, you need to provide for my livelihood because I just got divorced and I got nothing. And so, I mean, there's not an, there's all the other kind of pieces that are going to supposedly fit into place in a context where the whole thing is operating under Islamic law. So this is all a new ball game. And we were dealing with what do you do with recognizing Islamic law in a pluralistic, we're going to accommodate kind of way that's also recognizing all of the other pieces that are also not going to happen. So I think there's a lot of room for those kinds of arguments. The thing is that you'll run up against counter arguments to the same kind of position. You'd say, well, okay, there's a place for community property. If you think about it in terms of you know, uh, what she put into the marriage, what the both parties put into the marriage, and so she's getting compensated for it in some way. Um, that I think is probably the most plausible argument of like her housework kind of work. But it doesn't exactly play out if the, if the, if the demographics change. For example, on a strict community property basis, the wife would also, her property would get to ta half of taken by the husband. Under a strict Islamic law classical analysis, that would be a violation. And she might actually even feel that way, that that's a violation of you don't get half of my property, I might get half of yours, but you don't, you know, so it, it, there's a lot of complications here of sort of how are we going to work this out? And that's why I really think that there's a real opportunity for doing Islamic law analysis in a context that we are living in today in as pluralistic, multiple madhab possibilities that we could see happening and have the scholars and the people and the legislators, everybody debating it at, in a public sphere that has some kind of respect by the Muslim community that this is actually legitimate Islamic law analysis going on. And what, what happens is we're devoid of a lot, I mean, this has happened since colonialism, but we're not having the same kind of institutional structure that's going to create a respected you know, institution that's, we, well, if these guys are doing the analysis, that's a legitimate fiqh analysis. So we're, there's, it's happening in a lot of places. This person will write an article, this person will write a newspaper, magazine piece, this person will do, you know, high level, you know, uh, you know something at, at a level that's very academic that the people don't know about. Um, the more that's done, the better we are. It's just, it, we're at a very interesting beginning place. You don't have to, because we can go to another question as well. But, yeah, but I, I want to, to, to okay. respond, to answer to the previous uh, question. I, I forget to, uh, Jean Bowen, uh, he's not here. No. Ah, so then. <laughs> because I wanted to, to, ask, to answer to your question. Maybe I can answer, even if he's not here. Uh, concerning, he asked, uh, why in the, in the case when, when uh, spouses receive maher, why they don't, uh, people say, why they don't uh, separate the asset? Uh, classical Islam, in classical Islamic law, uh, concerning uh, the, the goods or, or the asset, it should be uh, what belongs to men is belonging to men, what is belonging to women is belonging to women. So there is a separation of the regime of the asset. And th the logic is that, that uh, a woman cannot uh, receive uh, mahar and also receive uh, a half of the asset. So this is the logic. Uh, I, I think this, is an this could be an explanation. Well, yes, because it could be, uh, because uh, I think, I think uh, the system uh, which is applying, uh, I call it patriarchal liberalism. Patriarchal liberalism in the sense that women received maher, received the alimony, received maintenance, received asset, and don't pay nothing. So this is patriarchal liberalism in the sense that all the obligation, uh, she received all the obligation from the men, but she, she, don't pay, she doesn't pay nothing. So I think this is a, a distortion of the, of the system, of the equality system. And w when you use uh, uh, Western rules and Islamic rules uh, uh, to reinforce, uh, to change the relation between spouses, this is what I call patriarchal liberalism. It could be uh, 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 whether uh, Islamic or Western, but not to make uh, mixed, it, it would be just patriarchal liberalism. Do we have a final question here? Let's go for it. We have Again, two, we're gonna go to two, actually. In terms of the rulings in relations to divorce, there are some, a number of opinions or a number of rulings relative to the concept of matti'uhunna at the time of divorce, which is to spend on them each according to his means. And that has been interpreted in some places to actually for two years of maintenance, which been contrary to the existing classical period, which is the maintenance for three months, at least in Egypt, that's the standing ruling at this particular time, at time of divorce. So can we possibly see maybe the development of that language be included in the contract in such a way that 
to become a contractual part of uh, Muslim contracts, especially in uh, Muslim minorities in the West taking that route. Let's get the last question, which is over there, Hedy. Sorry to make you run, but. Uh, yes, I just wanted to comment on um, this comment that you couldn't, you either had to do Islamic law or you had to do secular or American law and you couldn't mix the two. And I think that perhaps if we did focus on the common value of Adil and Kist, or justice and equity, that we could find a way to, to think, uh, and it would have to be contextual. It would have to look at what was the arrangement, or what hardship it would put the wife into or husband into. So we can't really just make, or, uh, you know, we can't make categorical rules or statements about this. And the concern should be the principle of fairness. And one can argue that any, any judgment that satisf satisfies that principle uh, and satis because fairness also is a subjective feeling. There's an objective and subjective aspect to it. But if it satisfies the parties and it satisfies the general understanding of fairness, that it is an Islamic ruling. And I'd like to see that more, th these principles incorporated more into our discussions, uh, even of case law. Thanks. Okay, final comments from the panel. Um. I agree. It would be great if that was the focus. Unfortunately, this happens to be the one, the family law cases happen to be one area where the parties are so far beyond, most of the time are so far beyond that being their primary focus. It is so context so contentious. There's, it's all usually about property. There's so much emotion involved. It's very hard to separate that out and just focus on, on that. And so the judge is, is required to do that. And, and it's, it's just, it's very, it's, the emotions are running very high in most of these cases. You can see it, you know, falling down um, at many levels. Um, so it comes down to a war of, 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 of words and, 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 a, and a using legal systems um, as part of the game, as part of this is my rights under this legal system. And, and it just comes back to the pluralism questions we've got at, 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 on the table here is, OK, we're operating within a context of a secular you know, liberal legal system, and we have claims of religious accommodation. How are we going to do that? Um, and, there, and, and I agree that it really does need to be done on a much more case-by-case -case basis than, than people tend to think in when they're speaking about this in abstract, because so much changes depending on the details of the case. So no easy answers. I agree on the principle that we should use the fairness principle and, and justice, but how we will apply this? Uh, justice is, is a formally justice, substantive justice, so we, we will disagree on, on the concrete uh, application. Well, if that, Denise, do you have anything yet? Okay, well, thank, this has been a fabulous panel. I've learned an enormous amount.